Okay, are you ready to rock? You can share that microphone. Have you put it on? Yeah. Perfect. Parisa, we met you earlier, and some of us, a lot of people, met you, Donna Jones. You were talking about handling uncertainty in the decision-making process. <laughs> Everything is clear after that. Ah, use the microphone. Use the that could be the confusion at the higher order. It's hard yeah, to exactly, say. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Jonathan Reams. You, um, you, you have uh, 20 years of pig farming, seven years of dump truck driving, <laughs> and a PhD in leadership studies. A perfect background when it comes to agile leadership, okay? Good. Is it good? And then we have Mary Williams. A geek? <laughs> that was says about you in the program. A geek and a manager it's, of it's geeks. Accurate. And at Twitter, you're also the uh, geek manager. Yeah. yeah, as your nickname. <laughs> just, just to ask you, you you're also CTO. Mm -hmm. And you, you also um, runs the micro consultancy Chrome Rose. I would like to start to ask you guys, and now you can ask your questions to the panel via our interactive tool. So I would like to start to ask you, what would you say is the biggest challenge for, like to say, modern organizations today in this fast changing and complex world? We start with an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll start with a trite answer. Um, so I think adjusting to, to a world where we have to optimize for change rather than optimize for delivery. So we've got lots of, lots of organizations that have been building railways and they now need to be able to build boats and cars and motorcycles and they're not really set up for that at all. Or probably they need to build something that's not a transport mechanism as well. My metaphor is falling apart, run with me. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think optimizing for not knowing is the thing that we're really, really terrible at and we have very little evidence of um, organizations that have scaled and done that really well. You were talking about that, Donna. Sure. I think the biggest challenge right now is shifting trust from systems and processes to people. To just trusting that people, when given the conditions for perform, you know, for, for trust, for, for belonging, and a goal that's worth going for, they'll get it done. That's the biggest challenge. Is that that head that shift in head in headset. Parisa, what do you say? So I can just add to what you say. I believe in that, and I believe that. So the main challenge is to be more and more aware about ourselves as a person and about human being, how we act, how we behave, and how we think and how we feel, what's going on behind that, what's the stream that is going under all this. So more you know about it is more manageable, everything around you. So it's what I believe. So building on the uh, notion of unknowing, I remember generating a table topic for a World Cafe session. It was about how to have integrity with unknowingness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we have. How do we find a place of stillness and integrity in ourselves that can be present with that unknowing? We have a good question right now in our tool. How can we stimulate traditional managers to embrace personal growth and new leadership qualities needed for the future? Um, I had a discussion with one of the person was here that uh, we have a fixed mindset and uh, growing yeah, growth mindset. Everybody may hear that. I think learning organization is the organization can survive all these changes. So it's just to be open to learn new things from different people, from the people who are under you or above you. So just be open to that and learning and learning and just don't be fixed with one type of management style or one type of thinking because in this globalization world, in this changing world, you, you, if the train is going on, if you stand, the train goes. So you have to go to the train or you have to run after the train. You decide. 
But if you have to deal with people that are using their reptile yeah. brain most mm -hmm. of the time, or the limbic, maybe, yes. how, how do you deal with those people? Uh, maybe it sounds very easy, but it's not easy, it's very difficult. Uh, again, because you have to work with your own reptile brain. <laughs> you have to understand what makes you uh, feel fear. Because when you know yours and you have respect for that and deal with that, you see it easier in other people. Because you know what we do? As soon as we see fear in others, we try to ignore it. We try to see, we don't see it because we don't know how we have to tackle with it, deal with it. So, but if we see in ourselves and try to see what can I do about it, it's easier for us to see in other. Uh, one thing I say to leaders, when stay in uncomfortable zone. Because as soon as it becomes uncomfortable, we try to fly it, we try to do something. Don't do anything sometimes, just stay there and listen and be alert and ever and very present to the moment, what happened in the meeting, what happened in that people around you. It gives you a lot of information that you lose when you just go to the flight zone, when it's uncomfortable. So stay in uncomfortable zone. You get a lot More of More reflections. Exactly. Start with yourself. Yes. I mean, I, I suppose I've also, over the last few years, been doubling down and going, you're scared already, let's scare you more, then let's show you something that might feel safer. And so helping people see a thing that is, so I'm from the tech side of things, so just finding space for someone to go off in the corner and build things in a better way, and then you show them the better way, rather than letting everybody spend all the time arguing up front about um, the specter of the future that is so very, very frightening. Um, so some, sometimes you, accept that fear and then provide emotional safety by showing a better world rather than dreaming of a better world or telling them that a better world might happen. Being able to show concrete reality calms people down a lot um, when they can actually see it in front of them. But what is the best way of, for teams that want to, to change in order to, to um, uh, influence their management? I think it depends on the situation. Like bunch of places, a bunch of the biggest success stories are actually just places where they got air cover. So I was part of the team that built the government digital service uh, in the UK, that built gov.uk um, in a very modern and agile and product and user focused way. And most of how we did that was we had Martha Lane Fox, who um, was the um, digital champion for the UK government. She wrote a white paper that said we needed revolution, not evolution, and we got enough air cover to go just do some stuff for a while. Um, and then we could come back showing the thing rather than telling people about what might be possible. And I think some t if in the UK government, which is driven by fear, as we've all seen recently, um, <laughs> <laughs> at least somebody else brought Trump up before me. Um, but uh, but you know if 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 you if you if you are in a situation where that is a a given you can't you can't unfear an entire government um but you can provide emotional safety by showing a better way um in a different organization i'd take a very different approach so yeah. success stories yeah yeah show them another tip oh, wow. When you asked the question, I had this image come to mind, you know, because I hear this a lot. People are making changes, and somebody said this morning, then you bump up to the next level in the organization, and they don't quite get what you're doing, but, but what they're doing impacts what you need to do. And I saw this uh, sign in the U.S. There's often a lot of people standing on the side of the road with a cardboard sign, something, you know, to get work or money or whatever. And there's this picture of this guy in an immaculate suit and tie, said 15 years of MBA experience, you know, needs work. And I show this in training sometimes and say to people, so did he, does he have 15 years of experience or did he have one year of experience 15 times? And so the motivation for people is it's like grow or die. You're gonna, your organization, your job, whatever, is gonna become irrelevant and get left behind if you don't engage in this kind of growth because the competitive advantage now is in developing the human resource capacity, the, the people, the personal growth, 
That's the competitive advantage. It's uh, in my and hopefully, hopefully I'm answering the right question here, but it, it's very personal. I, I it's, I mean, I myself in the in the world of unknowing <laughs> that part of it. I I live on the edge all the time, and there's places and times where I'll it'll be something minor that'll trigger the back end of the brain. I'll just be going, oh, okay, wait a minute, and and it's pulling that back. So similarly for the managers that are in this tricky spot of shifting direction, it it's a question: Are they ready? Because if they if someone is ready, then they know it's just these things are going to show up like the, the, the moments of anxiety and the moments of holy moly, now what? They will show up, but it's a guarantee. There's nothing perfect about this journey and there's nothing perfect about any anybody or any person. And that's what makes us beautifully, you know, beautiful in, in, that, in our own way. So it, I think it's about being patient and about being, uh, uh, if I can use the word loving, it's about being accepting in the, in the, in the moment and, and just allowing that person to see themselves in a different way in the world and that's really it because I know some of the big changes that have happened in big companies have happened because they've put all the management team together they've taken them off into a places they've never been before um, right out of their comfort zone completely and and that allows for new eyes fresh perspectives and different conversations to take place and I think that's really what we're always doing is stimulating different conversations but along with that a different experience because it's about how you see yourself and your place in the world and what perspective you hold that makes a difference. So I think we, there's a lot of compassion required in making this shift from one way of being a manager to another way of being a, a manager. But I think it's also about accepting that for some people you're attacking their identity by saying that this change has to happen. Um, I'm just young enough to be a millennial um, and every like think piece I read about what shitty assholes we are as a generation just amuses me because I'm like if you believe that loyalty to a company is an essential part of your identity of course you think that we're shitty assholes because <laughs> our worldview is trusting the company to look after you is irrational because we grew up in a world, well, and I grew up in South Africa during a massive amount of economic turmoil, like trusting the government or the company to look after you. Like we have not, not only zero evidence that'll happen, we have plenty of evidence that it won't. And so we're acting very rationally by not placing company or um, organizational loyalty above, um, above ourselves. Um, but if you're a key part of your identity is that being a good person and a good, is about being a good employee and being a good employee is about loyalty, just to pick a really specific example. It, you're attacking someone's identity and their sense of self when you say that's not important anymore or that's not sensible anymore. And I think that's, that's where the really deep-rooted fear and the massive amygdala, <laughs> amygdala hijack happens is when you're, you're telling somebody, like, not only is the world changing, but who you have to be has to change is a really scary thing to do to somebody. And when you're, you think you're having an argument about, like, in my world, like, continuous delivery or scrum or, like, you're not. You're having an argument about whether somebody's mere like whole existence is valid anymore um, until you take the step back and realize that that's what you're doing you can't you can't have a healthy conversation or talk about healthy change because you're you're attacking who somebody is um, even if you don't intend it that way uh, i thought to one experiment with you guys uh, to see what happened in us when we think about change can everybody close your eyes and breathe very gently? Close your eyes and breathe. I want you to imagine that you come to a new city. In the right side of the city is light, light everywhere. Candles, light, lamps everywhere. In the left side is just dark 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 which part of city do you want to go to come back don't sleep it's even after lunch come back how many of you wanted to go to the light side of the city usually happen the light of city is the part that is our habits our behavior that i call it we are addicted to it our habits it take us there and those lamps, those candles is of our knowledge and our experience. 
make it light. If we have been there, we know what's happened to us. The dark side is the change. We don't have any experience and knowledge what's going to happen. It's dark. It's dark not because it's bad. It's dark because it's, uh, we, don't know, it's, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Uncertainty and unknowledge about that. So to be a good leader or a person who wants to dare to the, go to the dark side, you have to be able to take one step after one step. Every step you take to the change, you learn something new, you experience something new, you put a new light there by that. And after a while, sometimes after change, you see that the other part that is light is much more nicer than the other, but it was just cover on unknowingness and that you don't have experience about. And as you say, we are very afraid of to do that because it, we take it very personal. Because when we, come, when we become addicted to our behavior and what we know, our judgment part or decision part of the brain and the part of the brain that able us to choose the prefrontal cortex doesn't work anymore. The, the limbic system, the emotional part take over. Uh, I can give an example. They made an experiment in the hospital in US and they check women that was domestic uh, um, violence with domestic violence they go there for one two weeks to recover after they finish their uh, medical treatment they ask them where are you going now what do you think was the answer home, home. exactly why because i know when he'll hit me why he hits me and when he hits me certainty is clear for my brain i know What's happened? So complex are we human beings. We stay in the worst situation because we know what's happened to us. Why you don't go to a new man? Change. I don't know when he hit me, why he hit me. And so we, so uh, just let me just complete it. That's how we human being works. So to be able to get from the habits that we have, to uh, have encouraged to do something new, we have to question our core values. Because new uh, research show that, that a part of the brain, prefrontal cortex called ventral, medial prefrontal cortex, name it is not important, but it's a small part of the prefrontal cortex that is very sensitive to our core values. When we think about our core value and practice it, this part become active. And when it become active, the emotional part of brain that make us addicted to our uh, uh, behavior become come down and uh, become inactive. So his new research show that how with value, a strong value, you can manage our behavior that is uh, destructive for us. Sorry if I was... But, but can, you, can you describe an organization that is, is organized to actually accept humans, mm -hmm. how we work, change, and, and also how to speak the, the, the importance of, of growing? So... There's a couple of articles that came out in the Harvard Business Review in a book now called An Everyone Culture, How to Become a Deliberately Developmental Organization. Comes out of the work of Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy at Harvard. And it talks about how you can take the kind of second job that everybody has, which is basically protecting your amygdala, trying to not look like an idiot, trying to, you know, position yourself, make yourself safe and secure, and make that personal world part of the work world. And what they do is help organizations use practices where they integrate what the job is externally with how they're relating to the job, what does it evoke in them as people, and they see that by using practices that help them work with that, they perform much better in terms of traditional measures by growing as people and devoting specific institutionalized methods to do that. 
I have another question here from the audience. If we optimize for change, we're talking a lot about change today. If we optimize for change, isn't there a risk that we constantly change and never deliver? What's the purpose? It doesn't stand here, really. Well, that's the question, though. What's the purpose? Is it just to change? Or is it to change for a reason? Your purpose guides all of that. Otherwise, there are no results. So, so is it possible to both change and deliver? It, what, what's changing, though? I mean, um, in any kind of adaptive behavior, if you think of environmental biology and all these kind of things, what changes in the DNA of a species that allows it to adapt to a new environment is about 2%. 98% stays the same. So often the job for leaders is to help discern what is it that needs to change and what are all the things that stay the same because that will help the amygdala calm down. And if you know what is it that needs to change, then it's much easier to go forward. So I tend to try and make the conversation about optimizing because I think change has a big capital letter at the front and people think of a change program and that it takes years. And like, but I mean more the day by day you've got to, there's a, um, there's a great quote which was about skating to where the puck is going uh, which is an ice hockey analogy, which as a South African makes little sense to me. We don't have ice. Um, but like trying to figure out where things are going and, and heading there, there's a great quote about how Blackberry was um, sk skating to where the puck was going. Unfortunately, um, Google and Apple were uh, brought in like heat heat blowers and melted the ice rink and started water skiing around around it. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that tends to to smash organizations from the side, take them, like we can be incrementally optimizing, but we also need to be looking at what's changing around us and get ready for what's going to happen. Um, BlackBerry stopped making phones this year. There's a very um, famous, you know, the famous story everybody knows of Kodak knowing what was happening to their industry. They knew digital was gonna, was gonna take them over. They were unable as an organization, even with that knowledge, to change fast enough and well enough to, to not die um, or to not, you know, to a great extent die um, and f figuring out how you see what's going on and make make change every day not make change a big thing that distracts from delivery so i'm canadian and it was wayne gretzky i apologize i apologize <laughs> <laughs> yeah hockey fanatics <laughs> i have a question to you guys because we're talking about change and the importance of doing it fast enough and it's mostly on the management level that that we see okay kodak they didn't do it if the CEO or other people in the management would have really seen it, maybe they would be here today. If, if Kodak thought their mission was to help people share memories rather than their mission was to sell film cameras and film, then they probably would have um, been able to adapt. We have talked to, about to, the, to, add to, yeah. the, to add to the mission to the point. Vision, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very good. My question to you guys, if you open your phones, is how big impact, let's see, maybe we have the, Here. My question is, how important is it that all management functions are capable of managing in a rapidly changing and complex world? Again? How important is it that all management functions are capable of managing in a rapidly changing and complex world? I will just change here. Is it not important, somewhat important, important or very important? This is called biasing a test by showing the results to... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we see here that it's very important that all management functions are capable of managing in rapidly changing... Do you think so, the panel? Do you agree? One of the interesting things that happened in a conversation I had with uh, uh, Michael Pakanowski, who heads up the Center for Innovation, with uh, and he was with W. L. Gore for 28 years, is that he was telling me, and it's on the it's on the podcast, the Evolutionary Provocator podcast, the program. But he he talks about a company. He's, there, there were seven tiers of management in this company, and no one above the fourth tier could see the impact that any of the decisions were having on the customer. 
So that gives you an idea of what this hierarchical structure does. And it means that if this is going to happen, if the management functions are truly going to be capable of managing in a changing world, they're going to have to get out of the office and go down and visit the rest of the world. There has to be some movement in that and an intentional desire to close the gap. But are, is there any of them in, in the management level that are more a key player than another one to really get that competitive advantage? Uh, well, I think you're finding their competitive advantages is in their partnerships and in their attitude. There's a number of companies that, in fact, the whole podcast this year is focused on examples of companies that are designing themselves differently. And they have the competitive advantage depending on what they want it to be with. Is it in the sector? Is it with themselves? Is it with their client? You know, they, they, they choose that. And, and they're, they're no two are made alike, but yet they're made of similar principles. So transparency, autonomy, the freedom of people to go and do what they want to do when they want to do it, uh, those kinds of things. The principles are very ubiquitous, no question. Um, does that answer your Yeah. Another question to you guys. How urgent is it that companies update their traditional performance management way of thinking? How urgent is it that companies update their traditional performance management way of thinking? Is it not urgent, somewhat urgent, urgent, or very urgent? <laughs> Thank you. That was my first thought. <laughs> yeah, tell it. Yeah. Not everyone here. Yeah. Rena, you say it. Yeah, no, the, Rena, I had the same thought at the same time. What performance management? Just ditch it. If that tells you you're managing people and not the work, that's, the, that's a clear signal that you've got a company that's doomed because they are not paying attention to the right things. They are not focused on the people they are heading for the management metrics. So they're measuring, and we talk about this in the companies that, that mimic life conversation. These are companies, if they're, that's the thinking, these are companies that manage by their stats instead of by their accomplishments. It's completely different. My, my favorite quote from, I'm going to pronounce it in Otto. Did I pronounce that right? Uh, almost. There we go. Um, from, from the session just before lunch was, um, why are we spending so much energy trying to get better at something we shouldn't be doing in the first place? Um, which is pretty much my exact thought on performance management, performance management systems. Like giving people a great feedback loop so that they can um, develop and learn is hugely important. I don't know that, I don't know anybody who's ever described a big company's performance management system as an effective way of giving people a great feedback loop so that they can learn and develop. Maybe one of you has one. But if so, come and tell us about it, because we'll all be like awed and shocked and amazed. <laughs> no pressure. So what, what would you say? What, what does it take to really be in the front line of organizational change? You put away your microphones, all of you. <laughs> and they roll off. <laughs> You know, what, what does it take to be in the front line of organization? I'm not even sure that's a laudable goal. I, th I think the, the laudable goal is what does it take to be the best we can be? And perhaps, maybe. But it, it, it boils down to just jumping in and learning and being willing to try something different, being willing to step out. It doesn't have to be far. You don't have to, but it has to be far enough that you get enough confidence and trust that you can take a bigger step the next time. It goes back to, you said that earlier, it's just keeping, keeping things at a level where you know, we are not in a, a small incremental change environment. This is not the time to make these little tweaks. So it's easy to tell companies that are still managing by mechanical thinking, metric, you know, that because they are making increment, they're not using the complex adaptive system to adapt. So, the only way they're going to make those kinds of jumps is if they switch it to thinking they recognizing it's a complex adaptive system, let's use the system, and then you'll get radical change and you won't break any brain cells, you won't hurt people, you'll have, they'll have fun, it'll be entertaining, and it'll be powerful. And I think that's the front line. The front line is focusing on people and what people can do that they don't know about yet. In fact, nobody knows about it yet. Yeah. And that's the exciting part. My, my favorite thing I, so I think I say a lot is we should stop pretending that decisions are permanent. No decision is permanent. Like the world doesn't allow any decision to be permanent. And I say that coming from a country that just voted to leave the EU. Um, anyway, um, I will stop harping on Brexit in two years time when they fucked it up completely. Um, 
but my my <laughs> my my favorite um thing I learned at this conference last year was a thing that um that um James said when he was talking about sociocracy, which is um you can make good decisions by saying, is it um good enough for now? and safe enough to try. And I've taught every leadership team, management team, every company I've worked with in the last year that exact phrase, because I think it's a wonderful way to go, um, can we move forward? Is this, is this good enough for now and safe enough to try is a wonderful way to make um, good decisions that are fast enough, that keep you moving, without everybody having to be like, this is the one true decision that will never be changed again, because that's just scary and activates everybody's fear response. Right? So I, I get a, a quick question here. How do you secure then that feedback and development takes place? How do you secure that feedback and development takes place? Um, I, I can say some, one thing about feedback. Uh, have you ever heard that somebody say, I have constructive feedback for you? <laughs> and uh, do, what do you feel? OK, what I've done, am I right? <laughs> that they want to make it in the nice way and tell me. Don't play with people because our brain gets it directly. Feedback is very important, but never give feedback to the, person, to the person as a person. Never point to a person. Always give feedback to the process, to the problem. I used to say, put the fish on the table, even it smells. So talk, this is the problem. What should we do about it? And we, it means you who, I who done something wrong, and you who is manager tell me, what should we do about it? Then my amygdala doesn't think, oh my God, what should I do about it? What should we do? So we become a team and look at the problem. So my amygdala comes down. Some people says that, okay, how about that? The problem is some behavior in the person. Then the person is problem. And I say again, no, the behavior is a part of the person, not the whole of the person. Never questioning a person that you did wrong, you are not capable, you did this problem. Say, this behavior we have problem with. Let's see what should we do about it. How can we get rid of it? So talk about the problem helps that the process go quicker because the person start to think that how I solve the problem. Does this work at home with my husband and kids as well? Uh, yes, and I have one, one uh, advice for people at work how to get, uh, try to get people's brain to start to think more solution than problem. I always say, when the team group uh, people come uh, to you and ask a question, that's the problem, what should I do? I always ask them, what's your suggestion? Usually maybe they say, oh, you are the leader, you know better, is the problem, what should we do? Say, go and think and come with three solution with all <laughs> pros and cons for that, advantage and disadvantage for that, for all three. With this method, after a while, you train your people's brain to focus on the solution, not the problem. Then when they come to you, they know that they have to come with the solution of the problem, not with the problem. So it's one method to help to train people's brain at work to think about solution, not the problem. So I was uh, thinking about what you said earlier about, you know, change or, and decisions being forever. A good friend of mine, Bonnie Roy, who will be here in Stockholm in about two weeks, I think, or a week? Two weeks. Um, she has been talking about open participatory organizations. And one of the key principles is that you're always just working from new starting positions. So this notion that wherever you're at, you can stop and say, where are we and how do we start from here? What is really going on? And in relation to the, the question about what is the front line and how do, you know, a, a friend of mine has a lovely Skype quote from William Gibson. It's that the future is already here. It's just not equally distributed. <laughs> and, and I think about that because I hear about all this IT agile stuff. And I remember 20 years ago reading about a Swedish company in the cable and wire handling business that was totally flat, that was totally self-organized. So the future is already here. There, the front line is where is it for each of us individually and as we work together. And that's our starting position. 
So what would you say, what, what is the most important leadership skill to actually lead in this new, rapid, fast, agile environment? I'll wait till I give my talk after the panel for that one. <laughs> well, mine comes from the talk and it comes from also, it's about sensing. It's shifting from analyzing everything to just sensing it and working with what emerges. So it's a lot of, uh, uh, it's merging the spirit of the workplace with the all all the rest the other domains the entire all four quadrants uh, together and and the whole thing came about many many years ago when i was working part of the knowledge and innovation network and i heard a story from a colleague of mine about dave packard who did the 12 the principles of the hp way and somebody who asked him one day you know how do you know when these principles are working because back in those days hp was a completely different kind of company and he said well i, I don't know he said but i can sense when it's not and I thought that nailed it just, and that was way back then. So yes, they, the future has been here for a while. Semco in Sao Paulo, Brazil, good example. There's, there's been companies doing this outside stuff. That's why when you mention names of companies that are doing the kinds of workplaces we're talking about here, it, people, a lot of people don't know them because they've just gone and done it. And they haven't been in the news around killing their customers or other you know, unethical things in the pharmaceutical industry, <laughs> naming no names, so. What would you say, Paris and Mary? What's the most important leadership skills to, to really succeed in this complex world? For me to encourage yourself and people to bring not the best, the unique idea from themselves, because we can't be best always from, if you are top, there come one, another person can be better than you. So don't try to be best company, try to be unique company, and we can do it because every single person who sits here, even if you were identical twins, you are different people, because the neuron connection in your brain is exactly based on your experience of life. Nobody else has it. So you have unique idea in your brain that nobody else has it. So if you are a good leader, trust that. Bring out from yourself and people around you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the, the question a slightly different way. Um, I think people moving from believing their job as a leader is to direct to their job as a leader being to enable. Going, my job is to make sure the right stuff is possible here and to help the people who are closest to the problem solve it in the best way and to make everybody know where we're trying to go, what our mission is, and then trust people to, trust and verify is a phrase I use a lot. Because um, I think you can, you can just take away these old structures that we know aren't working. Like you can take performance management away, you have, to, you have to replace it with something that helps you both trust and verify because blind trust goes wrong the first time something bad happens people are they overreact and they want to move away from that so helping helping leaders move from thinking that their job is to have the answer or their job is to have the direction to their job is to make the space in which great things happen um, and I think it's very difficult but I think it's also probably the only way we survive so I will give some short answer <laughs> yes it's more commercial but but it's really that it's not about a skill for me it's about the quality of presence. You lead who you are. You cre leaders create the weather, the culture, the spaces in which people feel safe or not safe to innovate, to take risks, to do new things, to explore, to learn. And so it's not so much a skill, but just a way of being. So we need to change the title of your presentation. Because that's what are no, the new skills and No, then I'm going to talk about mindset. skills. <laughs> <laughs> Once you have the, the, the presence, you also need to operationalize yeah. it. So I'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in like uh, 10 seconds. So thank you so much, the panel, for sharing this with us. <laughs>